Richard Fox is a poet who was born and bred in Worcester, Massachusetts. He said that he attended Webster University as much an artist colony as college in the early 70s, and the diverse cultures of Worcester and Webster University shaped his worldview and love of words. And in 1990s, he had a morning drive time radio show called Cross Tracks, which was part interview and performance with singer songwriters and spoken word artists. And Richard uh, claimed that he was enriched by his guests and they pushed him out the door into poetry venues. In the early 2000s, uh, Richard went on not only to share his poetry and as a radio host, but was president of the Poetry Oasis uh, located in Worcester, a wonderful poetry open mic, um, and also at the time managing editor of Worcester Poetry Journal Diner. And the goal for both of the, this wor uh, these jobs, this work, was to grow poetry in Worcester and be a resource for new and established poets. In 2010, he, Richard was diagnosed with throat and tongue cancer and started treatment on Groundhog's Day and ended in June and has been cancer-free since. And um, Richard stated that his brain didn't clear enough to write poetry until 2012. And since then, he has been a support and resource to others in uh, helping to deal with cancer diagnosis and going through cancer and has been spokesperson on his blog and in his poetry readings as well. And uh, Richard uh, stated, uh, I've been asked if cancer changed me. There's no way for me to know. All that happened was in a series of slow cycles. I feel freer and more focused post-cancer. Perhaps the lessons of cancer affected my approach to living and sense of self. Cancer takes, but cancer gives. Every day is a gift. Richard is author of two poetry collections, Time Bomb and Wandering in Puzzle Boxes, and he's here to share some of his poetry with us this morning. Please give a warm welcome to Richard Fox. I'm approaching, uh, my dad passed away just about two years ago, and we're approaching that time. I wanted to start off with a poem I wrote for him. This is called Tefillah Echad, which translated means uh, prayer one, but it's not a prayer, it's more about prayer. Chant sacred words, cradle syllables in a sphere of air over tongue. Dad is dying, doesn't know my kiss. Chant slowly, all tone steps, toe to heel. He has lived more than 90 years. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Every breath saturates my lungs, seeps out for a full blessing. Longer silence between ears throbbing. Seek their harmony, fluttering in chest. Dad's image rests on the back of shut eyelids, a slideshow of snaps, time to pulse. Scan the topography of prayer, savor each utterance. In dim shadows, light slithers up the spine. The floor I sit on extends to dirt, body not be held as separate. I am grateful for every year of Dad's life. Thanks offered as I plunge, into flashes of yearning, grace, surrender to what was, what is, what will be, pursuing favors not for myself, rather, mercy for strangers. We are but one another's guests, spirits wandering in puzzle boxes, hungering to stay and to return. Uh, I grew up uh, working in the, fish the family fish market when I was six years old. My grandfather handed me a fillet knife that was uh, sharp enough to shave with if I shaved at age six. Uh, this poem is, is about uh, much later on, probably about 15 years later. It's called uh, 15 Years Cutting Fish in the Market Only Once. The Wusthof fillet knife slips off eel skin, melts into my thumb, a painless slit. I slide the blade out, see the white of bone, 
stare at the eel on my butcher back, a gray, greasy gray garden hose leaking oil. No nana nino, I always put up her fish, peers through the glass case, taps on a pane as my thumb begins to bleed. I yank it away from Nonina's eel. She calls, Capo Unamani, Accidente, to Wimpy, Maine fisherman, counter kingpin. He limps over, grips my thumb in his left hand, pops a raw skull up in his mouth with his right, drags me by the digit to the utility sink, turns the hot water full bore, rinses, squeezes. Blood trawls down my hand onto my arm. Wimpy scalds off gore under the tap, presses a white rag to the wound, eases a box of kosher rock salt off the shelf, packs incision with halite crystals. My hand stings as he wraps gauze tightly. My hand burns as he shrouds gauze with adhesive. He rotates my wrist, pokes at the dressing, pulls a rubber glove over my hand, fastens an elastic band around its base, thrice. Wimpy grins, orders me back to work. No need to pinches my cheek, rubs my shoulder, Ask my, asks me if I mind skinning her ear after deboning. I swallow blood off her package of pulpe, wipe the wust off. It will be my pleasure. Uh, this is over a Mass Pike poem. Um, mass, this is a Mass Pike daydream. It's fun to daydream about high school when you're over 60. To Katrina, wherever you are, XO, XO, XO. I drive the Mass Pike past your city. Well, it was your city in 1969. We were juniors in high school. A 30 mile romance meant bus rides and walks from the station. Your dad and my dad agreed. It was too far, too fast for novice operators. <laughs> We'd eat dinner with your parents and sister. I was quizzed about school, the fish market. When they'd leave for a movie or the mall, you'd grab Monopoly or Life, open the box, arrange the board to mid-game. Then we'd leap onto the couch, mouth mash. Your braces bruised my gums but I didn't care. When lips were too sore to collide, our eyes traced track light halos. My arms rested on your shoulders, your hands clasped my waist. Our legs lurched until finding purchase. Laughing as much as talking, we defied gravity, parents, homework, jobs. When we heard the garage door rail, a quick kiss brought us back to bridge chairs, the table, the board. One of us threw dice. Your mom, dad, sister came into the room. Our faces red, our lips swollen. Sister hugs us. Your parents acted as if they believed we were playing a game. 45 years later, I still grin. Touch my tongue where carved gums drove me into daydreams of you. While my teacher's mouths shaped lessons or my knife fillets, um, skin fillets with one stroke. Um, as Cheryl said, I went to a school at Webster University, which was then Webster College in uh, St. Louis. And here I was uh, coming from uh, Worcester, Massachusetts and going out into the great Midwest into a city with a whole different racial heartbeat. Uh, I wrote this poem just about the time of Ferguson, and so I'm told this is my Ferguson poem. It's called, It Was One of Us. Ray, six foot two, shoulders that carried kegs like cans, charcoal skin, knee hole jeans, red t-shirt, vests populated by black power pins. His girlfriend, Rebecca, minister's daughter, albino white, a wisp wearing peasant blouses, gypsy skirts. In heels, her head caressed his collarbone. First year of college, greenhorns in dormitories. A slick nine ball shark 
were in collected quarters at the pool table. Most of the guys were flush East Coast whites. He grew up in a prol Midwest skin ghetto. Sinking the eight ball, Ray would grin and say, the black one always ends up in the hole. When we talked about the draft and Vietnam, Ray lectured about brothers emoliated by the Kong. If we counted with Jews in cattle cars or shuttle boys as cannon fodder, Ray would pop a ball, shake his chin side to side, shut his mouth. At Muddy Waters, a bartender ignored him to serve whites. We grabbed the guy, told him to give Ray a beer now. He looked up into the stolid face, hat brim cocked a tad, drew the draft. Ray wouldn't brook our anger, said it wasn't ours, but his. He was one of us, but we were never of him. One night in the pool room, a bottle of Boone's Farm apple appeared. Those that could hack sweet vinegar took swigs. Ray knocked back half the bottle. Three games later, the swiggers knew the wine was spiked. Ray never did acid, didn't even smoke the occasional joint. He started talking about men with ropes stalking the windows. Handshaking, he dropped his cue, ran out into the quad. We found him on his back, thrashing in dirt, flailing arms and legs. Afraid he might run into a wall or the street or a glass door, six of us pinned him to the grass. Ray kept tossing me off his shoulder, but I hung on. An ambulance wailed in, all flashing lights and siren. Ray bucked even harder until the paramedics needled his arm. Forty years later, we gather without Ray. He dropped out of school, out of our lives. One of us says Ray is homeless in Soulard. Who spiked that bottle crashes the conversation. It's a spirited debate, towny or prankster or stranger. I say nothing. Um, oh, time's flashing. Um, as uh, Cheryl mentioned, I'm a proud graduate of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, and I write a lot of cancer poetry. This one is called Agita, which is also a poem, a poem form. Um, it's a 14-line poem. The first line is 14 syllables, and there's one less syllable to each line, so you end up with a one-line syllable. This was sort of, um, this is one of the first poems I wrote after, during recovery, when I could think, and it sort of reflected my days. Agita. If I die today, bury me in this purple blanket. I'd ask for the dog, too, curled in the crook of my arm. He isn't the one with cancer and likes you more. If you have shiver to sit, he'll fill your lap. Thanks for cleaning the floor when I pass out and spill formula from my peg tube. Please hold my head as I vomit. Blanket bleeds all our scents, my drink, drool, and food stains. In the grave totem, not for my warmth, but my nose triggers faith. Thank you. By the way, uh, uh, Agita, uh, best translated from Italian, is existential heartburn. Uh, and I'll do another cancer poem. Um, chemo is a very powerful drug. Uh, and after your first treatment, which, you know, everything is new, you can feel it coming on. And this is about sitting in the chair and feeling the effects. I, uh, cisplatin is the name of was, was one of the drugs in my um, chemo cocktail. It's a very nasty uh, chemical. My infusion nurse smiles as she releases the clamp on my pick line and invites cisplatin in. Veins chill at the port. I shuck off a shiver. Earns me a hot blanket, cup of tea. Tongue tingles. A creeping plows the skull, just below where the ball spot roamed. Drink my cup, creeping seeps deeper. A pulsing tick adheres to the brain. 
Shut my eyes, breathe stale air. The IV pump whirs, thrilling scale. A familiar tune, a familiar room. My nurse brings bottles of water. Five minutes since I peed. Swallow flat, metallic fluid. Tick embraces entire cortex. Stem emits cotton. Yes, cotton. Drip by drip engulfs each lobe. The nerves limp, bump in line. Try to read a paragraph. Sentences, dug ditches. Sunshine pours in southern panes. Ice forms on roofs snow. Melts and freezes, melts and freezes. I am cotton ball brain. It feels, it feels. Lights have halos. Fan tickles my skin. My stomach trills. I fart. Nurse buttons my wool shirt. I have three blankets tucked about me. Boston Red Sox cap, freezer boots. Rabbit lion gloves wait on the table. Wind whacks the building. Rails, windows. I clasp my elbows prepped for winter. And I have time for uh, uh, one more quick one. Um, the funniest room I've, I've ever been in is the waiting room for radiation. Um, it really hurts to laugh, but it's a pretty funny room. This is called On the Nature of Humor. I'm on the gravy side, every day a personal best. Cancer could have killed me five years ago, but my chemo cocktail won. My compadres and I in the infusion room, tethered to our pumps, pudding, wooden spoon, bottle after bottle of water, crucial prognoses. Some, like me, good odds. Others cancer only held in check perhaps 18 months, even three years. Being short, they knew the sickest jokes. I memorized them all. Thank you. In theaters, sawdust, sweet, sweaty paint, backstage flavors, tongue linger, patient as the words waiting to be spoken by cue quiet actors behind velvet curtains. Dressing room light bulb hot last night's flowers in graveyard rank. Iron hot garments smoothed by clammy hands on eager thighs. Air hairspray thick, counters littered, false eyelashes, curling irons, powder, brushes, sponges, bobby pins, lipsticks for any role. Angenou, Baud, Rake, or Duchess. It's all so genuinely, fabulously fake. <laughs> Grandiose, the wickedness, heartache, passion revived night after night. Hamlet ponders being or not. Bodies litter the stage, defeated by vice and vengeance. Dee Dee and Gogo, underneath their skeleton tree, don't go. Wars are lost and won, the hot tin roof cat parades desire and lacy slip. Backstage, we listen to audiences sigh and guffaw, become balcony rats, watching the cheese we made devoured by the public. Home, we are home. <laughs> Thank you. Questions, remains of self, how does one find home when stranded in vast plains of unforgotten memory? To recall life as it might have been, with spirit lifted beyond measure. How does one take hold now of a supposed future when he dissolves more each day, as bias reigns deridingly cold night after dark and night? How does one grasp unknowns said to be his, worked silently, 
beneath his own being, while drenched in nothingness and viewed often in doubt. Naked, bare truth takes hold now. This is how he found himself. As time would flow, he stood by, waiting with supposed hope, embracing still what was not his own, of those he would never know. <coughs> and forgotten, he, evermore, of presence, of kind, of nature, of his own semblance, stilled, stilled at last, and yet he becomes now his own blessedness, perhaps rightfully so. Thank you. Another Holocaust? What is your excuse now? <clears throat> like broken dolls you lie there with incredulous eyes looking toward heaven demanding an answer that will never come. Your laughter or little bells will hear no more, nor will your little arms ever embrace us again. Your quick jumping little steps no longer will dance the earth ever again. Somebody without compassion snatch our future. They cover the earth with death and the heart with mourning. There is no hope for mankind when it reaches the degradation point of breaking the children. I, to the land that gave birth to the murderers, I, to the vile men who committed the outrage, I, to us that continue under terror, I to our children, what is their legacy? That's broken laws. <laughs> I can't go back. I go on. Memories turn, then move along. Let me cross childhood terrain, trespass eminent domain, echoed places left behind from distant time. Run down paths of hard packed dirt and weeds. To a haven where red brick ruins stood Secret hideouts going undercover None would find us, no one would And I can't go back I go on Memories turn, then move along let me cross childhood terrain, trespass eminent domain, echoed places left behind from distant time. Struggling against grey winded nor'easters, to grassy dais where my bold youth bore witness, to pounding waves crashing in, crashing in. Power far beyond my small self can't go back. The child arrives to say goodbye to this childhood place where no memories die bound by roots in window frames fossils of shadows left unnamed and I can't go back I go on memories turn then move along let me cross 
childhood terrains, trespass eminent domains, to echo places left behind from distant time. And I can't go back, no, can't go back. can't go back Thank you Gaggle of grackles, ravenous sparrows descend upon my lawn to picnic on the seeds laid out that very morn just takes one bird to spread the word as far as two woods over now, bumping into one another, chirping, burping, no one looking, slinking into the yard. Black patched white cat from the hood, good times to be had. In stalking mode along the fence, low to ground, sans any sound, eyes transfixed on the feathers. He settles into crouch position. A bounding leap from the bevy, and he stares. Thirty seconds without blinking. What's he thinking? Is he choosing? Instead, he whispers, meow. <laughs> Birds in panic scatter to trees. Black Patch turns, saunters away. Transcendentally pleased. <laughs> Thank you.